I want to start off by saying I think we're going to be involved, if we're honest about it, in the, in the fight for our lives. And I don't put that in terms of being about hyperbole. I'm not arguing that we're in the midnight of the century. I'm not arguing that we're in that, but what I think we are, we're on the road for the biggest kind of polarisation that's taken place with a big part of it going to the right. And it's important that we understand it's polarisation and convergence. What I mean by polarisation? You have to understand that in 2018, it's 10 years since the crisis hit. It's 10 years where before they told us the invisible hand of neoliberalism would solve all our problems. Where we saw the banking crisis, where we saw people's lives ripped apart. Look at Greece. Look at what's happening in terms of austerity, the devastation that's been ripped all over the world. And the truth is, the first people that people turn to, it's not true that it's all been to the right. They turn to Holland. They turn to Obama. They turn to the left. That's the truth. Is the majority of the turning has been to the left. Even in this country, you had half a million people join the Labour Party. Last year, when we were talking about the election that took place, we were talking about a massive swing towards Corbyn's Socialist Party. You cannot have that without their polarisation taking place, without a swing to the right as well. The real question is, why have you had such a coalescence of the people that took place on the 9th of June, something I never thought I'd see in this country in my lifetime, 15,000 people, um, were, they were racist, fascist, they were, um, took place in central London, who went on the rampage to the point they attacked the police, attacked us, and actually to a certain extent, I want to sound the alarm to say that if you allow that to grow, not us, to be honest, because all of us were there. All of us have been out for the last several years arguing against this. I think we have to say to people that this is not just an objective situation, it's also a subjective situation. The truth of it, in this country, I, I believe that you would have had the National Front, the BNP, objectively there's nothing special about Britain why it doesn't have a mass fascist party. The key thing has always been a subjective, immediate response in order to stop them. And I think we're involved in that. But there are significant changes that we have to take account of. The first thing is the growth of the alt-right. And the chief commander of the alt-right is Trump. Trump reaches the parts that we don't want to reach. This is a, this, the, the truth of it is, there's a little baby Trump going to be flying over the demonstration on the 13th, yeah? I just wish it was him, that we could just pop him, and then he would go down and disappear. But the truth of it is that what he's done, think about what he said to Angela Merkel in a tweet last week. He said, the people of Germany are turning against the leadership as migration, migration is rocketing a ready um, tenuous coalition in Berlin. Crime in Germany is way up. Big mistake to let all these millions of people in who strongly and violently are changing our culture. In other words, he immediately linked migration to change of culture and actually put in there, it's a far right idea actually, it's a far right idea that crime and race are connected to people. And that, that what that does, it makes the links of people like Tommy Robinson and all those other people feel that they have got a kindred spirit not far away but in a position. I don't know if people remember a man called Hawk, um, York Hyder. Um, he was the leader of the FBI, he was, a, he was a fascist. He did a brilliant thing, he drove his car over a cliff one day. And, uh, and, 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 and uh, um, although he had won the election, he drove his car over the cliff and, you know, and we all shed lots of tears, not, do you know what I mean? And I wish that many of them would follow his advice as a fascist and do exactly the same thing. But th the point is we're gonna have to help them. And part of that is to make sure that on the 13th we have a mass demonstration because what that kind of, the, why, do they love, um, why do they love Trump? Because he puts forward the argument about the question of political correctness. He unites people like Bannon. What did Bannon say when he met Le Pen and France? He's done three meetings across Europe. He said, let them call you racist, a xenophobe, a nativist, a homophobe. He goes, wear it as a badge of pride. And he was on um, question time. In other words, the alt-right have a a kind of theory about what's wrong with the world, and the key thing for them is that they're anti-establishment. The establishment's in crisis, and they present themselves an alternative to that. It's not true that they're just another capitalist party, they present themselves an alternative. Anybody who saw Trump speak in Michigan before the election, you would understand why. He got up, and he turned around, and he said, the people that run this country, the rich, and you're striking, it's like, it's him. It's you, you're the greedy bastard that's run doing all this thing. The rich, the profligate, the evil. And you're thinking, the, the truth is, they're able to repackage this stuff 
but they articulate an anger that's taken place since the end of the crisis. The crisis of capitalism is a crisis for the established parties, and you see it all the time. They had a cabinet yesterday, didn't they? What's the most amazing thing they said about the cabinet? The cabinet came to an agreement. You think about it, a government turns around and says the cabinet, Theresa May, has got somebody, people to agree. The whole point of being in the cabinet is do you agree in the first place? And a part of the right is the question of Brexit means that they can't really solve the problem of Brexit. The problem of Brexit is where does British capital go? Does it go to America or does it go to, uh, go to Europe? What does it do about the trade war? All these uncertainties mean that there, and the crisis has meant there's no hope in terms of an immediate solution. And in between them, actually what you've had, you've had the racist populists come out. Who are the racist populists? I think it's very important that we define our, uh, uh, we define our terms. On the demonstration, you saw people from UKIP. Um, UKIP, when you look at an organisation, one of the things we notice about organisations, they go through transformations. If you look at UKIP, the first time I met a man called Alan Sked. He used to, I had to go to see him because I was doing A-levels, right? This guy from Alan Sked was a teacher at LSE. And he came there, and he came there, he said, Britain used to be great because we thought we were great. And he goes, what's happened is we stopped thinking we were great, and then we're not great anymore, and we have to oppose federalism. He's the founder of UKIP, by the way. If you look at the people that give money to it, it's people like Aaron Banks. It's people like Desmond from the um, Daily Express that's given millions of pounds to it. UKIP has gone through a transformation. When Farage was a leader, actually Farage used to argue against manifestations on the street. What you're seeing now is you're seeing people like organisations like UKIP actually work hand in hand with street movements. And that's what you saw happening inside Germany with Pegida. You saw Pegida go out and then you saw the rise of the AFD. And so, really, what we're seeing is a strand of several different movements. We're seeing the, the alt-right have a kind of white pride. They, if, I don't know if people saw them on the demonstration, but they were all kind of foppish. They had longish hair, they looked like Spencer, they, they were clean and tidy, their shoes were shiny, and they had this pseudo-intellectual question about what to deal with the, uh, what to do the problem. They had a, a sense of that. You had a group of those, this identitarian movement. In other words, you, this convergence isn't an easy convergence to hold together. It is also shot through with crises. And the reason why I say that is because when you see the growth of far-right movements like that, don't get me wrong, it's actually terrifying to watch. And actually people are right to be terrified, but I think also we're not alone in that. Actually, I think that when you saw Lem McCluskey write inside the Daily Mirror that something had to be done about the growth of far-right, the thing we have to understand is large numbers of people that are prepared to, uh, are prepared to help us in terms of stopping, uh, uh, stop, stopping the far-right. The other point of it is the... Um, the way that they've grown off what I describe as racism by the state, the hostile environment, the growth of Islamophobia, is at the heart of many of the arguments of, 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 of the of far right. Take a racist populist party like inside Hungary, Fidesz, that's grown up, and you see Viktor Orban produce a, a motion that says we should stop all immigration into Europe, and he does it on the basis of stopping George Soros, which is an openly anti-Semitic argument. What makes me sick was all these people that said that Jeremy Corbyn was anti-Semitic. They didn't say a word. In fact, Boris Johnson sent him a gift of a congratulations. They'd actually come into government from the Foreign Office. In other words, they endorsed an, uh, an anti-Semite um, in terms of that. I think that what you see, you see these kind of movements take place. If you look in Italy, you see the rise of Liga Nord, another racist populist party. Again, it works with Casa Pound, which is a kind of another street movement that goes on onto the street. And then you end up with Matteo Salini, Salini coming to saying, taking over the interior minister and saying, letting people drown. In other words, they only get 15% of the vote, fundamentally, but what their main impact to do is to swing politics to the right. They start to shape the debate that takes place. And that's what's partly taking place here. What the growth of the hostile environment came out of an argument of the Tory party of how to deal with the 4 million UKIP votes. It's not true at the moment that the ruling class is in such a crisis, like they did in the 1930s, that they're going to elect an Adolf Hitler. The truth of it is, a fascist party, as Leon Trotsky says, is a razor in the hands of the ruling class. It wants to drive a tank over the back of the working class. It wants to smash all the institutions uh, in, inside, inside society. It wants to build, if you want to build a fascist party like that and come to power, at the moment, I would argue that that potential of them doing that immediately is still very, very difficult in terms of leading at that level of counter-revolution. But it's still a potential in terms of what they're trying to do. And we're still on the road in terms of those organisations that are trying, to, uh, are trying to build. But what they are doing is changing the whole format of how we live and, 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 um, 
and, and how we organise. For the first time, I think, since 1945, you have people from the Vlams block come and speak in London and openly say they're in the, that they supported the Waffen SS. And I think there's these shifts that are taking place. The normalising of the unacceptable is part of what's the problem. Look at Donald Trump. When there's a demonstration, um, a demonstration in Charlottesville and Heather Mayer's murdered, he turns around and says that some of those people are very, very good. In other words, one of the things that racist populists do is keep opening up the space for these people to grow. But they don't have it all their own way. Look at, um, there's a man called Milo Yiannopoulos, right? He said he was going to do a speaking tour off the back of Trump um, winning the election. How many places did he speak in in America? Actually, two. And out of the two, only 50 students turned out, and most of the students were outside protesting against him. In other words, what you, when you ignite that kind of movement, there's a potential to build a movement um, against the fascists because people see what they like. He, there's a man called Jonathan Friedland, right? Jonathan Friedland likes to drop bombs on everybody, it seems to me, when I used to read inside the Guardian. Even Jonathan Friedland, even Tony Blair is saying there's a populist mood sweeping over Europe that is a threat to us. And actually, what that gives us the potential to do is to talk about building a united front with people, actually, who are too far to the right of um, uh, revolutionaries in terms of building a, 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 united, uh, a, united, uh, a united front. I think that part of what's also taking place is that the Brexit debate, the way that it is, I mean, they're wrong about the, um, uh, the thing about Brexit debate did something to the, to the hard Nazis, the classical Marxi Nazis. Do you remember the murder of Joe, uh, uh, of Joe Cox? You see a... British MP murdered on the streets of Britain by far-right activists, what does that tell us? That tells us that a group of those people have been activated. They're not activated by the Brexit debate, they're activated by the level of racism and Islamophobia that was um, <coughs> detonated by, I believe, the debate that took place at the top of society about what to do about, uh, uh, about Brexit. I want to give the definition of the four groups that we face. We face classical fascists, we face Euro-fascists, we face racist populist parties, and we also face paramilitary and street, uh, street um, groups. The classical fascists are like organisations like Jobbik or like Golden Dawn. They wear the insignia. They march on the street. They openly put out Nazi slogans. Since 1945, it's been much more, since the Holocaust actually, it's been much more difficult for those movements to build. But what's interesting is they're still starting to come out there, but they're still a minority. They're not breaking through. Much more. Um, influential has been the rise of Eurofascism. Marine Le Pen's organisation with 24 MEPs, two M MPs, six million votes. Partly the reason why she was able to build has also mean why you always have to stand out against Islamophobia. As well, her, her starting point her, was her father's starting point was a question over the, the hijab. In 1986, the um, Marine Le Pen and her father had 0.1% of the vote and they didn't have much space. They were able to build on various racist, racist waves in order to build up a group of people that supported them. But what they've done is that they said that you, Marine Le Pen's father and herself, you have to abandon the opening signiers. They don't have a street movement as such. They stick to elections, but the heart of it is an idea that they want to smash the French state and replace it with a fascist state. They want to bring about a plebiscite, but they hide who they are. They are a Euro-fascist party. But they, we, shouldn't, we should understand that as they grow, they give confidence to everybody else. Who did Donald Trump meet in America? He met Marine Le Pen. In other words, what's interesting about what's taken... I shouldn't say it's interesting, but it is. Is that the Nazis have formed what I call an international of the far right. And in other, in other words, they help each other. There's a comrade here called Andrzej Zabrowski, and he did a talk about what was going on in Poland. Tommy Robinson was on a march in November for the Polish um, independence march, and all the Nazis were there. So were people from Jobbik, so were people from, some people from UKIP. In other words, these people are all coming together and trying to work out a strategy of how to change, uh, to change place, you know, to, to change what's uh, going on. But I do tell, tell you a secret, the one problem they have got is that they're Nazis. Uh, and I don't, say that, I don't say that lightly in the sense that the one thing they do is they do unite everybody else against them. And one of our jobs, and one of the difficult jobs, is to make an assessment about what we're faced with without actually falling into a level of despair and coming up with strategies that we can talk about undermining them. I think that one of the things we have to do, one of the things that makes a difference, is the amount of resistance they have. There's a demonstration in Leeds taking place right now, actually. And the, it, was, it was around Tommy Robinson's case. Originally, the Tom Robinson people said they were going to get 1,000 people there. 
right? But there was opposition called against them, or the MPs signed, all the schools people signed. Um, people said that they were completely wrong. They tried to say they wanted to play songs for Morrissey, but people spoke out against what Morrissey stood for in terms of saying that Tommy Robinson was, was somebody that was sim symbolic. Actually, they've turned out with 150 people. Now, it's, it's important. We've turned out with, with 200, 300 people to stand against them, but it's important that what we understand from that is that when you oppose them, it also takes away their confidence as well in order to organise and operate. One of the things that makes people come forward is a sense that there's not going to be opposition. Because when you look at that group, the 15,000, there's the people there that say they're not Nazis, there's some people that say they're Nazis, and some people openly say that they're racist populists. We have to talk about how we break that group up, but we have to have mass opposition. There's a petition going around, it's got 20,000 people that signed up to it. I tell you now, when Tommy Robinson comes out of jail, I hope they keep him in jail, do you know what I mean? One of the worst things about racism, actually, is it's a disproportionate number of black and Muslim people in jail. I hope they meet him in there and actually explain to him about um, racism, do you know what I mean? Because the, the injustice system is, is unjust, but maybe we might get a little bit of justice at some point. In, in that movement to make him understand about, about what he is. But actually, what he, if you look at somebody like Tommy Robinson, actually he's quite astute about what he's been doing. I remember Tommy Robinson when he came on the demonstration. Three years, three years ago, two years ago, he came on the Stand Up to Racism demonstration on his own. <coughs> maybe we missed a trick there, comrades. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> there was 30,000 of us, we should have. Maybe not. But anyway, you know what I mean, right? Um, the point is that we've always been able to mobilise, but what he's been able to do is he presents himself again as an anti-establishment um, uh, person and part of the convergence is the whole question about the way that they've used um, racism against Muslims in particular the grooming issue in order to which fits in with the mainstream media who's been giving him help little little John inside the Daily Mail said that he doesn't belong to he doesn't belong in jail in other words he's had help from the top of those people who went to see the Lords but also another thing that's happened is he's had help from UKIP UKIP previously wouldn't stay away from somebody like um, uh, 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 Tommy Robinson, what you've seen is a breakdown of the divisions between each other. When the football lads launched the first time, they told Tommy Robinson not to come on the demonstration, right, because they were afraid of being the word about racism. That hasn't gone away. The one thing they keep writing to me and saying is we're not racist. And I keep saying to them, you don't get to self-define, right? If you turn around and say you want to attack Muslims, if your organisation goes around and burns down mosques, you are a racist and you are organising on that basis, but they go up and down and through different fluid, uh, uh, different fluid uh, uh, movements. The Day of Freedom, in the way that they were organising uh, the, the, the 15,000, tells us the potential to begin to, um, to, 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 to break them down because the racist populist organisations... Their aim is to stand in elections and win enough votes that they get into Parliament and shape Parliament through that. It's not really to remove, uh, remove democratic, democratic society. So what you've seen at the moment is that the UKIP people, uh, the organisers organize that were before organising around elections, are now organising around the demonstrations. If you want to know why the demonstrations are bigger, it's because they've actually taken an active role in building the demonstrations, and that's going to make a... Uh, 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 a difference there. The other factor that uh, I think that we have to talk about has been the growth around the football, the football organisations. They've done this by bringing different um, hooligan groups together, but even those hooligan groups are vulnerable. The hooligan group inside Liverpool tried to organise an FLA group and they were thrown out of Liverpool Football Club and people said they were closer to Mohamed Saha than they were to the Football Lads Alliance. And what that tells you is that it's not true that they're going to have an open ride in all these areas which they assume to be their own. In most of the football clubs that we've leafleted, we've, had, we've received an absolute open door in terms of people talking about resisting. And we've formed an alliance with people from Show Race and the Red Card in being able to show a kind of alliance. But what, what I think we have to understand now about the, the, um, the 13th and 14th is a question about what type of united front that we have to build now that can actually stop them. And I think that the first thing to do is to say that the, the, before when we tried to warn about the football lads, the growth of the far right and the convergence, actually part of our job is to educate people about the need to organise and build those organisations. 
When the EDL first launched, it never got more than two or 3,000 people, but when you said there were danger, people didn't necessarily listen to you. It took several years of patient explanation and working together for people to understand. I think that people have been shocked by, by what's happened of the march and are ready to support us. How do I know this? I mean, I know that in Newham and in other places, a man called Umesh Desai, who's a, who's a, um, a GLA member, and Umesh, and, and our organisation and Stand Up To Racism and different socialist organisations have had a, sometimes a love-hate relationship, do you know what I mean? Sometimes we've said that we've needed to mobilise and he's opposed us and whatever it is, and actually then we've hated him, right? At the moment, we're in love with him because what he said is like the rest of them. I think there's a shift in terms of the Labour Party to understand that there has to be a mobilisation against the, against the fascists. Now, Tommy Robinson, when we mobilise on the 14th, I think we have to prepare for a Tommy Robinson mobilisation in your town. Tommy Robinson, when he comes out of prison, is going to visit every single town in this country. And what we have to do is that when he organises, make sure there's a mass opposition against him. And that potential is that we can build a movement that will not only push him back, but also weaken the sinews that are building the kind of fascist organisation that's taken, uh, taken place now. And what we have to understand is a question about class as well. 15,000 people can come onto the streets, but the working class movement in this country is not defeated. We saw what happened inside Wigan. And one of the things I thought was interesting in the demonstrations against the EDL was the level of trade union involvement. I remember that um, in East London, when the EDL faced a defeat, one of the reasons why they faced a defeat was they all got on a train and the train never got there. And the reason why the train never got there was because the RMT members refused to drive the train to the station where it was supposed to go. And this means we have to understand the class basis of fascism. The class basis of fascism is the middle class, is the small petty owner, the people, the small farages. And in terms of why they need a street army is because they need to prove to the ruling class that they can control the streets. That's the reason why it was very dangerous when the FLA were chanting our streets because that's a prelude to talking about trying to challenge and shape what happens. They start off by doing that, and then, as the EDL did, they attacked Unite the Union, they attacked um, a picket line, and they attacked LBGT organisations. They start off like that, but they grow and they become much more nastier. I think that what we're looking at now is the potential for people to come to our side and say that they want to, they want to build a mobilisation that can, that, that can stop them. And it's important to think about the different forces that are going to be involved. We have to fight them culturally. We have to, this year at the carnival, they've opened the door to love music, hate racism. They want everybody to have the spirit of resistance that comes out of what happened at Grenfell, comes out of the opposition to hostile environment, and talks about a tradition that talks about building that together. We have the potential to, to do that. And that's what we want to fold into what takes place on the 14th. We're at the beginning process. We're not at the end. And it's important to understand that overcoming the resistance of the far right is also a question about what type of society that we've had. This is the fourth manifestation of fascism inside this country. Of course it's international, but each time it has been broken and beaten back. And how has it been beaten back? What do we mean by a united front? I think it's potential to have a united front with the leadership of the Labour Party, like people like Diane Abbott, revolutionaries, um, people that are all face the attacks, Islam face Islamophobia, black and white people, Jewish people that face anti-Semitism, it's possible to build a mass movement on a mass scale in order to defeat them. Much greater than has ever happened before, because you can feel it in terms of the society, in terms of the reason why the fascists have to hide who they are, there's a potential to build that kind of organisation. And one of the reasons why that organisation has been slow, hasn't built as fast as it, it, it should have done, is because when people look and you say they're a danger, people don't feel it automatically. If you live in London, you would not have predicted that 15,000 people would have gone into the centre. Why? Because the fascists have changed their strategy. In the old days, they would march straight into an area which is a large ethnic minority. I remember the EDL said they're going to march on Tottenham. And the police said to me, what are you going to do? Are you going to call a counter-demonstration? I said, no, I I'm not worried. I said, let them come. This is after the riots. Of course we would have called a counter-demonstration. They cancelled the demonstration. In other words, their strategy used to be to go to those areas of concentration because they were so racist. Part of the reason why they've changed is because they have this sense that they're part of a bigger group and a wider group. And what we have to do is to break that kind of coalition up, which we can do, provided we understand that we're the majority and they're the minority, and that we have to give some kind of political leadership to that. That's what the United Front strategy at the moment is. But I want to say something else as well. 
I think part of the problem we talked about at the beginning was that when you have a neoliberal crisis, a crisis of the extreme centre, one of the things that means that they're much more powerful is that they have an idea of a different type of society. It's not true that Tommy Robinson, the alt-right and the far-right don't have a conception of a society. They do. They have a conception where they get rid of the establishment and the establishment... What did Farage tweet today? He said the establishment are supporting the corporate right and that we have to do something about it. In other words, we have to have an idea in order to oppose them. Jeremy Corbyn argues for socialism, and we support Jeremy Corbyn arguing for socialism, but part of their reason why I think there's such a bitterness and such growth is the impact of austerity, the, the, the space that it's created, the ideological confusion, and the need of a wider left in order to give some kind of um, direction to that. The thing that we need most of all is a question of unity and clarity on our own side. We have to argue hard with all the other people around us that we can defeat them, providing we act in unity in order to break them. When you go to the Love Music move movement inside um, Birmingham and you see all the people come together and you see it put all over the, um, you see put all over the television, put over the radio, you see the potential for a much, a much bigger mass movement that brings all those people together. And that's the kind of movement that we want now that can defeat the, uh, that can defeat the far right. I think the, the final thing I, I want to talk about is why do we need, uh, why do we need, a, why do we need a, a socialist party? And why do we need a, a fundamental change in, in, our, in our society? I don't believe that um, Donald Trump has a clue about solving the crisis in the American economy, even with the trade wars. I don't believe that Theresa May has a, a, a solution to it, and I don't believe the right wing of the Labour Party have a solution to it. The problems that we face are so deep and contracted, they're as deep as part of the problems that are developed inside the 1930s, but they're taking place on a much longer scale. The, that ended in the Second World War and ended inside the Holocaust. The crisis that we face is just as deep and as long-trenched. And what we have to talk about is not only making sure that we fight the rats and the cockroaches and the Nazis that are produced, the racist populists, the Tories, we have to also talk about a different type of society that destroys the conditions that give rise to them. We, I think this generation faces the same problems that they faced in 1922, but we have an advantage. There's a man called Leon Trotsky, and he wrote a book called Trotskyism and the Fight Against Fascism. And at that time, he had 50 supporters in the entire world. I think the question of the United Front isn't just an abstract idea. I think it's the means of being able to transform a mass fight against fascism into a fight against, um, for, for socialism for a better society. It's about putting the working class at the centre of change of our society, fighting the ideas that divide us, but also pulling together those ones that can change us. And that's partly what, that's what we're arguing for. But to do that, we do need a socialist party. We do need, and I think we do need an SWP. We do need people that will stand away and say it's, it's important to stand in elections, but it's also important to talk about a different type of society and build a, an organisation that will fight for that. And I'll stop there. All right, comrades. Uh, I suppose what I want to talk about is uh, sort of leading on from this idea of the cultural side of it as much as the kind of uh, United Front work, which is obviously vitally important. Uh, and that's uh, the fact that a lot of this sort of the alt-right side of it, the identitarian kind of thing of it, has its origins sort of essentially online, on social media, on YouTube. Uh, and I would say this is a thing that we need to work with that we haven't, as the left on the whole, gotten to grips with, really. Uh, in the same sense that fascists in the 70s and 80s used <coughs> punk rock and ska music and all this to sort of as their recruiting ground, now it's YouTube. There's these immensely popular YouTubers who are putting out this absolutely vile shit all the time kind of thing, and this is really the recruiting ground for a lot of these kind of uh, fascist organisations. Um, and it's as well, you can see it, uh, insofar as there is a left in these spaces, like an explicitly politically left, uh, they tend to take a very identity politics privilege theory type of things and it's basically this little crucible where you have this identity politics, these left identity politics people uh, and these you know essentially white nationalists sort of pulling people to the right kind of thing this little crucible this is why you have things like the identitarians it's directly a sort of parallel of sort of left identity politics or you know left identity politics kind of thing um, and so I think what we need uh, th there is like for example the SWP all the this will be up on the SWP YouTube channel I was, and that is good and it's necessary as a thing, but it's a bit like trying to fight the fascist punks with folk music. It's just the wrong genre of thing. Uh, and 
It's not something we can really get into within three minutes, but it's something we need to get to grips with. Uh, and one of the things we need to do, I think, actually, because there are sort of, like I say, YouTubers, people who make these videos, uh, you make a living off of it, uh, who, who are certainly not as left as us, but in, within the kind of Corbyn to Sanders sort of range of reformist leftism, who I think we need to actively sort of court and bring on board and perhaps some of them are in, are in this country, are based in this country, bring them along to events like Marxism, uh, because I think that's, you know, it's no good us sort of coming in with our ideas and saying, it's like, oh, we're going to be YouTube stars now because we just don't have the skill set for it. We need to bring them people towards us. Uh, and, yeah, and I think there is a real base for that. If you look at the way YouTube works, these people are essentially creating the value that the platform runs on, so they are exploited in the Marxist sense. So I think there is a real sort of uh, opening there. Um, so, yeah, that's... Just all I want to say, I think that is one element that we are missing. It's a long-term element. Obviously, opposing them on the streets is absolutely vital and absolutely all, all of this would be pointless if we are not able to do that and smash them there. But in the long term, I think that is a thing we also need to do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Barbara. I'm from the International Bolshevik Tendency, and we work with the Anti-Fascist Network, which is a diverse group of anti-fascists that is formed around two points of agreement, and one of those is to physically stop the fascists when they try and march through our streets. And the second one is that we do not collaborate with the state because ultimately the state and the fascists are on the same side. And as Wayman pointed out, fascism is what capitalism uses when it's in crisis to um, come out and attack the working class and the oppressed. So I want to address a question that he raised about what kind of united front do we need to stop the fascists? And this is really important because... A week today, exactly, there is going to be another huge demonstration to free Tommy Robinson. The fascists are going to once again be trying to take the streets of central London. There was a long time when they couldn't march through central London, but they are feeling Bowden that they are trying to do this, and we need to stop them. And Trotsky, when he was writing about fascism, talked about a workers' united front. And the basis of our fight against fascism has to be around the working class, because it is the working class that is most threatened by fascism. It is the working class that will be able to defend the oppressed against fascism. So we, there are demonstrations with speakers from MPs, MEPs, leaders of faith communities, and so on. If they want to support us, that's great. But they are not the basis of our united front. There's also the trade union leaders are writing letters to the Guardian and making speeches. But that means nothing unless those trade unions are actually bringing out their members on the streets or doing things like that example of RMT members stopping the trains. And often what you hear from these union leaders is all talk, but they do not mobilise their members. So we need to go out, we need to mobilise their members, and we need to get masses of people, workers, the oppressed, everyone, on the streets next Saturday, not just standing around or marching up the road and back, but actually trying to get and possess the streets where the fascists want to march, get there first and claim them, claim our streets and build a united front on that basis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you can take them all. You do the order. Women mentioned uh, and said we need to learn the lessons of history and absolutely we need to learn the lessons of history because we know that when the Nazis came to power in Germany in 1933, the first people they went for were the left. The concentration camps were not initially full of Jewish people. They were full of the trade unionists, the communists, the socialists. They were full of people like us. And they were full, not simply of people like us, but of also the trade union leaders, by the way, just so the last speaker should note that. It is a fact that they have Corbyn in their sights. No question at all about that. And I'll tell you why I know that, because we've just found out that the Nazis are going to attempt to disrupt Corbyn's speech at the Durham Miners Gala, which is next Saturday. Now, on some levels, I think... 
it's a very good idea for a group of Nazis to turn up at 200,000 strong <laughs> labour movement demonstration led by the National Union of Mine Workers. The last time they tried to disrupt the uh, gala, by the way, group of Nazis, um, they, they were lucky and fortunate that police were there and the ambulance service was there. However, the fact that they've decided to do it and they've called a protest to try to disrupt Corbyn yeah. says two things. One, they are confident. Secondly, that actually the people in the Labour Party, in the Labour movement, better start to take this matter seriously. And quite honestly, in a way, it serves a purpose for us. Because the fact that they will try that will bring it home to those people that this isn't just about a handful of revolutionaries arguing about the dangers of fascism. It is about the question of threat to the entire Corbyn project and the idea that we can have something as an alternative to this rotten, shitty system. Because the Nazis are a movement a counter-revolutionary despair. They breed on the despair that working class people have, but they don't want working class people to rise to fight it. They want working class people to turn against each other and sink further into the mire and further into despair. You know, it looks, when you see these Nazis, these fascists, 10,000 of them, they look impressive. They do look impressive. But they only look impressive on the condition that we don't understand the forces that we have on our side. Because when we begin to mobilise our side, they start to look like what Trotsky called them, human dust. And we need to mobilise our strength and our side. We have enormous strength. And one lesson from history we should learn is this. The argument for a united front between the Communist Party and the Social Democrats in Germany, by and large, was ignored by both sides. But there was one occasion when the Communists and the Socialists stood together, and that was when the SS, who are far more fearsome organisation than a bunch of pissed-up football thugs, <laughs> tried to march through the working-class district of Hal Altona in Hamburg. And the Communists and the Socialists and the Trade Unionists stood together. They had an armed battle. They killed 14 SS on that day. And they showed that if the German working class had stood together, Hitler and his Nazis could have been destroyed. We learned that lesson. We need that unity because these Nazis pose the same threat to us that the Nazis pose to the German working class. Yeah, comrades, I think <clears throat> when Wayman talks about the new formation that we see before us or in the form of the far right, I think fighting for an interpretation over that is very important. You see, I was on the account of the demonstration against the Nazis when they marched in central London. And you see, fighting for an interpretation, I would say actually that was an internationalist, nationalist demonstration. Now, what do I mean by that? When you have Gert Wilders, when you have representatives of the Front National, Jobbik, when you have a, a message from Stephen Banyan, the mastermind of the alt-right strategy, Raheem Kassani and others like that, you can see actually Actually, this is a pan, well, this is a global movement that they're pulling together. But you see, Wayman's also right to say we can't divorce that from the contextual situations and the material basis in Europe. What is the reason which, which the European ruling class give for the lowest living standards in Europe of all time? They say it's the refugee crisis. They say black and brown people are coming to Europe to attack and lay siege to the, to the continent. Not only that, they say they're laying siege to the European way of life. And actually, I think what you're starting to see is the emergence of a pan sort of European movement um, with a rejection and focus on the refugees like that. But you see, I think it's interesting. Some, a comrade said it to me, at least it isn't, the, uh, at least it isn't Mosley in the black, short, black shirts. They're not in uniform. I think comrades, actually, they were in uniform, but it was the new uniform. What is their uniform now? It's a very sharp haircut, it's a new suit, it's dark glasses and a camera phone. That is what the alt-right do, and that is what they're mobilising around at the moment. And you see, what's interesting is the final point that I will make is that actually I don't think we can let the, the uh, traditional conservative right off the hook. When Theresa May says, 
says she wants to create a hostile environment for migrants, where does that logically lead? It leads to 15,000 people marching in the streets against, uh, against immigration. When, when they march in, uh, in uh, Leeds, uh, the Tommy Robinson supporters, a mosque was firebombed and so was a Sikh Gurdwa. In Manchester, when we faced off against the DFLA in Bolton, uh, the day after, a Muslim woman had her hijab ripped off in front of her two young kids. This is what their freedom of speech means. And we cannot make any mistakes on this, comrades. We cannot be defensive over this question of freedom of speech. There is not freedom of speech, it is hate speech. And we have the right and we have the necessity to say we have to come out and fight against it. And you see, the final thing that I'll say on this is that actually we can't divorce it from the capitalist system that we live under. There is no coincidence that we're in the longest economic crisis since the 1930s. And like the 1930s, racism and fascism is now a viable political alternative across the world for millions. Now, why is that? It's not because people are born with racist ideas. If you've got no money in your pockets, who's it easier to blame? Your Muslim neighbour, your black neighbour, or actually those bloody bankers who take us into economic crisis after economic crisis, and by the way, still get their bonuses for doing so. Those are the arguments that we have to put to forward to our class. And you see, this is, a, this is what we, we as the SWP are committed to. We want to get rid of the dirty, rotten system that gives us sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, and all the ills of the system that we live under. If you agree with us on that, comrades, it's your duty to join us. Uh, I'm a member of the Anti-Fascist Student Network. and. Um, some of us were at the Tommy Robinson's Day for Freedom march. Yeah, all right, all right. Some of us were at the Tommy Robinson Day for Freedom march back in May, when um, th thirty huge football hooligans, what some of us call like gammon, were let in by the cops who just stood there and watched while thirty of these huge hunks of gammon were screaming in the faces of like elderly socialists and trying to beat up, beat them all up, and. Um, it just shows us that we, we can't rely on the state to, to counter the threat of fascism and that fascist mobilizations can only be smashed by physical confrontation in the streets. And effective physical confrontation requires not only uh, the, or, the, organiz <coughs> the organization of trusted groups of activists, as has been the tradition of militant anti-fascism in Britain, but also mobilizing large numbers on the streets in coalition with forces from different political backgrounds. Fascism targets the organised workers' movement, and a big challenge for the anti-fascist movement in Britain is to bring trade union members out in the streets against forces which already threaten their union headquarters. Like a couple of months ago, I think it was in March, when football hooligans and Ulster loyalists threatened to storm the TUC Congress House uh, against Sinn Féin, uh, a Sinn Féin conference that they were holding in there. Um, of course, we're, we're, we're going to face a lot of opposition from the trade union bureaucrats, but this is time and time again uh, an issue that we're going to have in defending the interests of the working class, both in the short term and in the long term. And as we're going to see next week uh, in opposing the Free Tommy movement, only the trade union movement has the social weight and the organisational capacity to crush the far right. Thank you. I think um, it's, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because we need to mobilize. We rightly understand the need to mobilize. We saw what took place uh, uh, on that day in June because uh, the 15,000 had a clash with the police. I saw the video where they pushed them back. You know, there was a real confrontation. They pushed them back across Whitehall and on the back streets. This is serious. Question is, what do we do in a practical sense? Because you want people to listen to you. How is that going to happen? And the way we did this in South London was we, we had a public meeting uh, of South London Stand Up to Racism. We had Speaker Jamala from um, uh, South Bank University. We had Kim, who has been doing refugee work uh, uh, to Calais on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the platform. We had Jocelyn from the uh, Lambeth uh, Black Workers Movement. And we had Pat, who was involved in uh, a, a, a Stop the War Coalition. We got 50 odd people there. But do you know what we did? We worked, we argued. And we said to the local trade union branch secretary of Unison, you need to be there at that meeting. We, you need to be there. 
right? And the people who were on the platform phoned them up and said, are you going to be there? Are you going to be there? No excuses. He also happens to be leading uh, in Wandsworth Momentum as well. He came to the meeting. It was a fantastic platform. But each and every one of them not only talked about refugees, but they were there on that demonstration uh, in Whitehall, and they said, this is the threat. This is the threat, and we need to mobilize. That trade union branch secretary then said, I will be holding a meeting with ones with momentum to talk about fighting uh, uh, you know, the fascists, or taking up the fight against the fascists. Tooting CLP passed a resolution that said, we need to unite and we need to mobilize for the 13th and, uh, and the 14th. As a result of that as well, the local refugee group in Wandsworth, as working with Stand Up To Racism, said they're gonna dra drape the banner across Battersea Bridge, which says no to Trump and all that kind of stuff as well. So that is a kind of a practical sense, but that sense, uh, you know, a message to the trade union movement that you practically have to get people there as well. And that had an impact amongst the RMT members as well. I know that in South London at London Bridge, they had a large uh, RMT meeting. Again, they went through what had taken place and how they need to mobilize as well. And I think that little bit of work is the central key part of mobilizing the movement. And I disagree with the person who says, you know, the trade union leadership aren't doing anything about it. I'll tell you what, I, uh, they've put their names, they've put their resolutions, but I think that people have difficulty of not knowing what to do, right? And we have, to sh we have to, in practice, go along and say, this is what we need to do. The lessons of the 70s are not there in people's minds. We are in new situations, so we have to tackle new situations in a local way and see how we can bring people together. And it's as important to look at the little details that can shift big ground and make a movement uh, that, that will oppose fascism. Okay, I just want to say it's absolutely fantastic to have these meetings and you can turn up in these meetings with a pre-written speech about how you think we should fight racism but actually it's not about the statements we make or the speeches we make, it's about what we do on the ground. So for instance in Manchester, we have systematically contacted people, the trade union leadership, labour councillors, community groups, refugee charities and talked to them, you know, explain to them patiently Sometimes when you think there's a real sense of urgency, but no, you've got to explain to people who the FLA are and who the DFLA are and who Tommy Robinson's supporters are and what they're trying to do. And actually, you need to set them to sign their statements, our statements. You need to start with that level, that basic level. And then you need to start saying, and are you going to come on the demonstrations? Now, our first demonstration in Manchester when the Football Lads Alliance turns up, we outnumber them. It's absolutely fantastic. I've, all, I've got four Labour councillors saying, come on, we're going to march. Well, you know what? I've been told there's only a couple of hundred down there. We can go down and smash them. Not quite what I expect to hear from a Labour councillor. But it was fantastic. The second demonstration, when we had the DFLA, unfortunately, we were massively outnumbered. Those same four councillors turned up with their mates. Now they've got eight councillors, which is absolutely fantastic. And they're still saying to me, come on, can we go down there and march? No, there's a couple of thousand. You have to explain to them. They were like, but, it, but I, I don't believe it. We smashed them two weeks ago. They're all over social media going on about how they were humiliated in Manchester. We have to patiently explain what's going on. And I just want to say this. We're not always going to outnumber them. That's the thing. But we have to be there. We have to have the arguments with people because actually there are a whole layer of people in the movement that don't understand. When they turn up in suits with their fancy telephones and they harass us or as they say to me, we want to have a conversation. We want to debate. Mm. We just want to talk. And then they surround the stand-up racing stalls in Manchester and say, these people don't want to talk to us. We think they're racist. In fact, one of them tried to argue with me that they were more integrated than the stand-up racism group because they had got a black man with them, who, by the way, they were paying for security, but they actually tried to use this. <laughs> I, but what's really, we can laugh about this, but what's really shocking is someone said they've got a new uniform. We can't. That is so true, because people don't recognise what's going on. They are not the thugs. 
you know, looking to beat us up. They are in suits, they want to have a conversation. They talk about how they want to understand how Muslim women dress with their hijab in this heat and all the rest of the bullshit they come out with. There is no space for a discussion with these people. Let's be quite clear. And if anyone is any doubt, we look at what Lewisham did when uh, Anne-Marie Walters stood as a candidate and actually the Lewisham anti-racism group united everyone they could think of. There were some exceptions to that where they argued, in fact, was it the Lib Dems and the Green Party who argued that we need to talk to these people? We need to keep them closer, that we can be friends and talk to them. There is no conversation with these people. There is no space to have a debate about whether I have the right to exist or not. And that is the line that we use. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, I, I want to talk about how actually we can build opposition to the racist and fascists anywhere, however hard the conditions can sometimes uh, seem. And I think it is a question that things have changed. It's a question of not panicking, but actually assessing the urgency, because we do have to start immediately. And I want to use an example of uh, uh, Rotherham, which people may know we had uh, uh, Nazis on 23, 24 occasions marching through the town after the uh, child sex exploitation scandal which hit the town. The racist, the fascist, every description, even the, uh, not just the EDL, the Ku Klux Klan from America, you know, you had heavily one for two or three years. I can tell you, for a small group of socialists in the SVP in Rotherham, it was a question, what do we do? And we set up an organization around United Against Fascism at that time. We're now building uh, Stand Up to Racism, but it meant saying that we are gonna make a stand here because um, you had the conditions of those 20 odd marches, but also the EDL had a, a camp, this is unbelievable, a camp outside the police station for six weeks, right next to the council building where they're abusing Asian council workers every day. The police were posing for selfies with them. This is the conditions we found ourselves. The police, of course, who were in the frame for the CSE scandal, they were quite happy to see the EDL there, and that went on for weeks. But they didn't build anything in Rotherham because we set about building the United Front that uh, Wayman and others have outlined, how we went to the unions. Our slogan in the TUC was, uh, justice for the victims of CSE, don't let the racists divide us. That stayed with us and we still use it today. It's taken us into a campaign which has opposed those Nazis every single time. Sometimes when we were, we were outnumbered, but mostly where we were able to show people that actually you can make a stand, you can fight back, and we can unite black and white together. It meant that after the murder of Mushin Ahmed, who was called a groomer, an 81-year-old grandfather kicked to death on his way to the mosque at three o'clock in the morning, we then had a demonstration which was the biggest we'd seen, the first time we'd seen the Asian community turn out, and it was a fantastic day. Of course, it didn't end there, it ended with the uh, arrest of the Rotherham 12, but I'm sure you all know we had a fantastic victory. Um, so it, it is that systematic work, you have to take on the arguments, you have to show people actually, those on the left, and there were many, said you can't oppose uh, the, the racism and fascists because they'll call you paedophiles. And when Tommy Robinson calls himself a hero, I want to throw up mm. because he's scum, he's a fascist thug. They want nothing to do with the CSE victims and help them like they don't want to help anyone else. And what we have to recognise is that we can actually beat them. We have the forces, we have to set about systematically. And I just want to say the last thing, Capitalism creates the sewers. That's where the rats are found. That's where they, they come from. We have to start to build a, for a, a future of, of socialist society which gets rid of capitalism once and for all. Right, I think the, it's, this one thing, of course, is that their size are organising internationally. Somebody mentioned, uh, a Czech speaker mentioned earlier today, rightly, there was a, an international if, uh, international, if you like, for them, their sides, the Penn, Wilders and others, just over a year ago in, in Germany. It didn't come out so well for them, but they're reforming. It's no, it's no accident that, that someone called De Winter, the Vlam's, the way we mentioned it, the Vlam, Vlam, Vlam's Balana organisation, uh, open Holocaust denier, 
um, was one of the international speakers who spoke for Robinson just, just last month. There's no accident at all. So it's only fitting, obviously, that we're organising in symmetry to these people. Um, somebody said again this morning, a young Catalan woman, anti-fascist and, and socialist, said, one of the problems we've got in Catalonia is that there's people who've been around donkey's years saying to us, don't worry, I've been doing this three decades, you know. No, 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 you just do this, you just do that, leave it to us kind of thing. What a disaster. Now, fortunately, she's got the sus to know to punch through that. And it seems to me there's a... There's a potential generation of people who haven't been around the 70s or the 80s or the 90s who are fresh, new, young and up for this. And if, if we can work, it, work patiently alongside those people, channel and uh, work very patiently with them in some respects, but also work very urgently with them, we can get a new, very great generation of anti-fascists. It also seems to me Robinson is like, <coughs> we've got a Trump in Britain. Now, I'd be, in one sense, for calling him Tommy Trump. The problem is, their side will probably think, that's right, he is a Tommy Trump. Good on him. That's, that's the problem we've got. Working class here on my ass. The bloke is, as people have said, he's a petty bourgeois individual. No two ways. Yes, he connects with working class people, but his class background is, is a classic fascist one. And I have to say this. When people come up and say about the trade union bureaucrats, yes, of course, socialist work is quite well known. Ask Len McCluskey, bless him, for talking about criticising trade unionists on various issues, whether it be over jobs, Grange math, whatever it might be. On this issue, I'm sorry, mate, you're wrong. The trade union bureaucrats are mobilising. Unite Today work with UAF, stand up in Leeds and mobilise. They're working with us next week, today, next week today in London to mobilise. So is the PCS. I've been round twice now this week with the RMT people at all levels of the union, from a rank and file to the top down. They're mobilising, they're getting us money, they're going round stations, they're doing ring rounds. It's quite right what people have said, but come on, you have to be... You have to get a grip here, I think. These things are so serious. The RMT aren't alone in this. So are the CW, and I could go on. Last thing is, as we're doing it, as people have said, we don't just go along and, you know, it's not a big loving, as, as Wayman and other people know. United Front is not a big loving. If it is, there's a real problem with it. The United Front is also contestation for ideas. We've got some good ideas, I think, and hopefully I'll see, we'll see out of the fight, with the fight we're in, we'll also see more people joining Socialist Worker. Okay, uh, I think it's uh, very crucial to understand the impact of uh, Trump in, uh, in Europe. Uh, he's creating uh, greenhouses for the development of uh, fascists and uh, races in every country. In Europe, they cannot say Europe first. It uh, finally ends in uh, Britain first, uh, Italy first, uh, Greece first, and, and so on. So they try to build in, in, uh, in each country the, the power of... Uh, of fascism. And uh, in order to oppose them, I will give uh, very briefly the example of Greece. We had Golden Dawn in 2012 and 2013. More than 1,000 people were stamped. And, and uh, th there was one murder, one Pakistani. And in 2013, another uh, musician was murdered. In order to stop this, uh, it was very crucial to, to build, to unite people, to fight them on the, on the street. But the main thing is, was the relation with, with the working class, the organized working class. That's the, the discussion about the bureaucracy and the unions is very abstract. What we want from them is to stand in big numbers, to use the industrial power of the working class in order to shake the government and to shake the state. Because the fascists, they had the cover of the police. They had the cover of the state. They had the, the governing party of the right wing supporting them. So in order to break this, if you don't mobilize the working class, you are going to lose. And the reality is, is in, in Greece is not that we just have big numbers. We outnumber them in most of the cases. We're very militant. That's not enough. The crucial thing in 2013 is that we want the trade unions to call a general strike in response to the murder of Pavlos Fisas in just one week, because the same day that he was murdered in his city, we demonstrated with 20,000 people, and the police was with the fascists. Even the day that the blood was there, fresh, the state was still with them. And we stopped this in order, because the movement was rising, the movement was connected with the workers who were fighting against austerity in, in that period. The government was afraid that they would fall from this movement. They retreated after a general strike. 
and uh, in the, the demonstration of 60,000 people who marched to, this, to, the, to the headquarters of Gordon Don. Now they are on trial. They ended in prison, 68 of them, the, the whole of the parliamentary group in that period. It's three years and a half on, on trial, and their leader said, we have two problems why we are not uh, developing after Trump is winning in uh, America and the far right in Europe. The first is the trial, and the second is that every time we try to, to stand, the anti-fascists are there. So that's a way how we, we, we can fight them. But definitely, the main issue is to fight against racism. If you forget that, they said Islam is not belonging to Europe, and they are trying to attract all the European governments. And last week, this happened. Merkel yeah. and the leaders of the European Union, they signed an agreement to, to close the border and to drown the refugees in the Mediterranean. If we don't fight, if we don't open this fight, we cannot close uh, the road to them. We need the power of the working class, and we also need a left that is giving the alternative of hope of them. We need both. Yeah, Tomasz from Socialist Worker Newspaper. I think in Britain we're seeing a realignment of the far right. And what makes it so dangerous at the moment is that the hardcore Nazis and the racist populists are being brought together in a way that they haven't uh, before. Uh, Jared Batten, who's the leader of UKIP, uh, has spoken at almost every single uh, demonstration organized by the Democratic Football Ads Alliance yeah. or by the supporters of Tommy Robinson. And at every demonstration, he gets up and he says, marching is fine, but if you want people to listen to you, you have to organize politically. And if you want to organize politically, I want you to join UKIP. This is an open call for fascists and racists to come into the ranks and to try and shift that strategy. Now, I think Batten probably wants to get them into the party because, in order to rebuild their electoral base at some future point. The problem is that the people joining UKIP now have very different ideas to just focusing on elections. Uh, Paul Joseph Watson of the uh, US InfoWars website, uh, which is an alt-right web website, joined UKIP and said, I've joined to take it over in a soft coup. Uh, other uh, you, um, Twitter personality, Count Dankula, has joined uh, UKIP. This is the man who was fined £8,000 because he taught his dog to Zieg Heil when he said gas the Jews. Um, these are the sort of people coming in. They've, if they're successful in that, um, I think that could radically change the nature of what UKIP actually uh, is. It was a story first reported on by Socialist Worker. There's more info on, online if you're uh, interested. And I think more broadly, this is part of a bigger process across Europe where you're seeing a sort of interpenetration of the traditional conservative right, the populist right, and then the fascist right. Um, you know, if you think about in Austria, similarly, you've got the FPO, the fascists, who then, in order to try and out the, the Tories, the, over, the People's Party tries to outflank them, adopts a program so right-wing that it's almost indistinguishable from the fascists, and that, that pulls politics all the way uh, to the right. Um, so I think this is part of a broader process. It's not just happening in Britain. Um, just uh, finally, I just want to say, when it comes to how do we actually try and organize, um, organize against them, I think there's a bit of an argument about uh, do we call Tommy Robinson a Nazi? You know, Momentum, the Labour left group, put up a video recently where it said Tommy Robinson and Anjum Chowdhury, an Islamist, are two faces of the same hate. They're the same problem. This is nonsense. I mean, Chowdhury is a, is a nobody. Uh, Tommy Robinson is a fascist. Now, not everyone who goes on that demonstration was a hardcore Nazi, but the, the pr point about calling him a Nazi is that that will actually try and, by, that's an important part of breaking away that sort of racist uh, periphery that he's pulled uh, around him. You know, when it came to uh, Oswald Mosley in the 1930s, when he organized a 50,000 strong rally in Olympia, now, a lot of those people were respectable middle-class people from West London. They weren't all just sort of hardcore sort of Nazis. So you've got to call them the Nazis. And 
next Saturday, I don't think we will have enough numbers to simply say we're going to confront them and stop them. But if we get two or 3,000 people out, that's part of a process of building to the position where we can actually break their confidence on the streets. How we oppose them is based on what threat they pose, but also the strength of forces on our side. And that's why next Saturday is part of building up those forces so we can push them back in the future. Um, hi, I'm from um, a coordinator at Love Music Hate Racism. So as well as next week being a really massive, important um, series of events, um, another event um, which we've got flyers on your chairs is for the Carnival, Notting Hill 2018. Um, as um, Wayman highlighted, it's a massive and really important event to actually celebrate culture and celebrate diversity, which makes this country great. Um, last year, we came fourth, actually, and it was only a number of fi about 50 of us. Um, this year, we're really aiming to try and get numbers up to, well, Wayman said 1,000, which, <laughs> which is good, but 500, I'm happy with 500 at least, so we can times that by 10. So um, I just want to really encourage everyone to, if you're interested, please take the flyer and email us your details and we can sign you up. Um, the theme this year is Sunburst, um, so the T-shirts, we, we'll be wearing Love Music Hey Racing T-shirts on the Sunday, and it's like Masquerade on the Monday, where you can like wear T-shirts and a bikini or more extra laced if you want to um, and it also kind of um, <laughs> extra lays if you want to um, as well um, the, the theme is really important as well because it actually pays memory to Claudia Jones who was a very important person in the role of actually organising Carnival so um, our, one of the slogans Smokey Joe who is going to be playing all the soca music his, his about, is about talking about pie with a purpose and we really believe that last year we got massive coverage um, in, during the silence for Grenfell and we really want to ensure that we actually bring the politics back to Carnival. So please, again, like, yeah, sign up and come along. Yeah. You see, I think there's a relationship between understanding the scale of the threat and then identifying the, the, the strategy for success in order to stave that threat off. Because in Germany, let's remember, the Nazis smashed everyone. The Jews, the labor movement, the leadership of the social democratic labor type party, the leadership of the communist party. That was why the divisions that Eunice spoke so uh, uh, earlier were so fatal, um, had such fatal results. I'm going to ask a no-brainer question. Does it make a difference if the leaders of our movement, of the Labour Party, of the trade union movement, of the revolutionary left, say, don't unite with them, which is what they did in Germany, or let's unite together? Does that make a difference? It's a no-brainer question. The question then is, how do we translate that into reality on the ground? And we're in an exceptional position in Britain. We have had 600,000 people join Corbyn's Labour Party. Don't tell me that that isn't an enormous potential to mobilise against the fascists and the Nazis. And it's a question of how we do that locally. You see in Newham, and I'll tell you, Newham SUTR is no well-oiled machine, right? We are not exceptional. But after the, after the Robinson March, our organising committee was different from every other organising committee we ever had because the majority of people there were Labour Party members, Momentum members and activists. As a result, we now have the Mayor of Newham has signed the statement. 26 councillors, almost half the council, council, have signed the Stand Up to Racism statement. Unmesh Desai, the GLA member for City and East, has signed the statement. And just as this meeting was starting, I got a text to say that Lynn Brown, the MP, one of our MPs, has signed the statement. By the way, she was chief whip in the pre-Corbyn era, just to give you a sense of the political map of that. And I'll tell you what, I think about four of those councillors responded to my initial email and approaches, four of them. 
Every single one of those other names was obtained by Labour Party members. Actually, one of them's here, Kevin over there. He was actually at the heart of the anti-academies protests in Newham. Um, Every single one of those names was got there. Does that mean we now have the potential to better build a real delegation against those fascist scum on the 14th? Yes, it does. It's not only a nice thing to have, icing on the cake. It's essential. It's about the approach you have. It, it underpins the unity that we have to build. Without it, it's not an optional extra. You have to unite both uh, the top and at the bottom. Otherwise, they will march and march and march again without the kind of opposition that we need to show them. I want to start off by saying that next week, um, Jeremy Corbyn gave us a videotape of why he was supporting the demonstration on the 13th and the 14th. The demonstration on the 13th has got 50 to 60 to 70 hundred thousand people that are opposed to Donald Trump. Donald Trump's hated. The truth is we're in the majority of people hate Donald Trump. He doesn't believe that, but then the man's delusional. Do you know what I mean? The, the point is we have to mobilise that as a strategy of being able to bring people that go on that demonstration to move on. This is always a question of numbers. I remember at Walthamstow, the Nazis said, they were, actually they were quite big, the Nazis actually came up, they were beaten by children. Why? Because there were so many children. It's, not, it's, it's about numbers and about density and about how many people you have. And it makes a difference what you do. It's not true that there's nothing you can do. The, the key thing about, I think, about fascist politics, about politics of despair, it says to us that we're not leaders. It says to working class people they have to listen to somebody else always to tell them what to do. If you want to shape your society, you have to fight every day for it. I learned that when I was 10 years old and a teacher came to me. I've been beaten up every day going to school by the National Front. I say this story and I went to see my drama teacher and he says, I've got some things to help you. I thought he was going to give me a bat. And he came and he pulled out a piece of paper. I was so disappointed, yeah? I was looking, what, what, what am I going to do with that? Remember I'd roll it up because then there was a football hooligan, you had this thing called a Millwall brick, you'd roll up things and you could hit people hard with them. But nevertheless, it's a different story. It was a petition and he said, go around your estate and ask people to sign it and say these people won't let you go to school. And I thought to myself, I'm a big man. I was 12. Right? And, and he went round and he signed, everybody signed the petition. I was shocked. Even the people who voted National Front signed the petition. Voted and they said, a little kid like you, they're trying to stop you going to school. Even the people that accepted those ideas thought it was wrong that you should be treated like that. And I went back to him and I said, how did you know that would work? He goes, people don't like Nazis. They don't like bullies. And the majority of working class people have a sense of who they are, even if they're poor by racist ideas. There's always a contradiction. But I'll tell you one thing that made a difference. He had anti-Nazi league on the petition. He had an idea about what it stood for. We had the weapons in order to organise. And I think strategically we have to understand it's true that the fascists are both polarising and converging, but also so are we. I think it, the truth is that momentum people are signing up and signing the petition. The question is about getting their bodies down on the demonstration and getting them organised. There's a shift where people, to be honest, sometimes I do think we have to go onto the internet. I agree. Anybody who's not signed up to go on the demonstration, please take your phones out and just click on it. It makes a big difference even in the numbers. But I tell you what makes a big real difference when real people turn out and do real things. You have to have a combination of both things, both on the internet and people really doing things. You have to fight for it. Um, I want to um, also raise the question of, it, the, the question of, uh, was raised about what do we expect next week? I, th I still think we're at the beginning of this process. Anybody who went on the early EDL demonstrations, I have visited every single car park in this country. I believe it. I strongly... If you said to me how to get to Wigan's car park, I can tell you. Right? But partly because that's what happened. And when the police came along, actually the police are contradictory. When there's more of them than there is of us, you stand behind them and you shout obscenities. Close your eyes, children. At the, at the Nazis, right? When there's more of you than there is of them, you ask the police to kindly step aside and you'll deal with it. It's always a numbers question. It's not true that just you look at the state and say they're neutral. Actually, the state aren't neutral. Could you imagine if a group of us had turned up and beaten the Metropolitan Police off the street? What would have happened? Do you think we wouldn't have seen on the newspaper the following day, find these thugs, find whatever it is? Have you heard the thing about we've hunted them down, we've arrested all those people? It tells you something about the state. When Gert Velders came out, did you, I don't know if you look at the film, he's protected by eight or ten police officers around him. They said that the, the um, government from Holland 
Um, the Netherlands government rang up and said he needed special protection because they thought he wasn't welcome. That also tells us something else as well. It's not true that what the politics of Gert Wilders is, 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 is automatically set. But I want to talk something about the United Front very quickly. There's a difference between a racist populist and a Nazi. Part of our problem has been, actually, we've had to juggle with the different tools. When we did UAF, to be honest, it was almost straightforward. You could literally say, call somebody a Nazi, and that was the end. But what we're facing is a complex situation where you have both state racism, you have racist populists like UKIP, who are not fascists, but they could become that. So you have to have a tool to do with that, with stand up to racism. But also you have to have, you have Nazis that are organising on there. We face that complex picture. But it, there is a simple answer to those kind of things. It requires political organisation and determination in order to break those, those, those people. We have to take round, and right now, we need the numbers now. Because I tell you what happens if you don't have the numbers, or you carry on organising we have done now. One of the reasons why they, want to, they had an international meeting in, in London, do you know why they did that? They said they hate the British anti-fascist movement. That's the truth. When you read the stuff on the internet, they said they hate it. And the reason why they hate it is they said that when Nick Griffin, they said, should be an MP now, but we did him in. Right? They said that the EDL, Tommy Robinson, has three times tried to break through, but he's been pushed back. We, can't, we don't want to lose that tradition. We don't want to lose a tradition where they feel that they can go where they want. But it is going to require work and sophistication in terms of understanding what we've got to do. And to be honest, I'm proud to stand at Marxism because it's a starting point. I think one of the most important things is that people understand their enemy. And I don't respect my enemy. I understand, uh, we understand our enemy because we've been armed by a Marxist analysis and been able to do it. But I tell you what makes a difference that you have an organisation that can do that. I want to join with the Labour Party people, with anybody else to, who's willing to stand against the, the Nazis. I want to stand with them against that to make sure that it doesn't happen again. I had the honour of going with somebody called Leon Greenman to Auschwitz. And he told me they took his children away and he watched them take them away and he knew they were going to murder them. And he said, they took these children away from him, and he said to me, there was nothing I could do. He goes, I never forget it. He goes, I said to him, why are you walking around with me? He took me as a, as a kid, and, he, and we went all around different places speaking. And he said, I went to Auschwitz, and they took my children away, and they killed them in front of me. And there was nothing I could do, because I didn't realise that in 1922, 1923, I should have done something about that. And that's why I'm talking to you, when One day I won't be alive, and I'm passing down this tradition that you join in an anti-fascist tradition, and when you see those people organising, you smash them, you organise them by brain, by political organisation. That's our slogan, never again. It's not true that that tragedy ever has to happen again, but more importantly, I want to make sure that when people talk about things like the Holocaust, or they talk about outfits or anything like that, yeah, they remain a historical lesson, but I want to make sure that we're the society is that we don't have that level of barbarism. There's a woman called Lose Luxemburg who was murdered by the Nazis, when she nearly read, led, read a, led a revolution inside Germany. If she had been successful leading that revolution, there would be no Adolf Hitler, there would be no Nazi party. In fact, our, the world that we live in would be different. So I want to join with people, but i tell you something. I'm shocked and horrified, to be honest, that there are people now saying that, they should do, that we, should, we shouldn't accept what happened in the Holocaust and that should happen again. We live in a generation that could repeat the same mistakes that took place in the 20th generation. We have two tasks. On the 13th and the 14th, come out against Trump, and we also have to come out against Tommy Robinson. But I'll tell you something else. We have to build something for a better society that means that those kind of things never happen again for real. And they can only never happen again for real if you destroy the conditions that continually throw up these people that not only want to destroy human beings, but destroy the society that we live under. And that task is for this generation, not just in this country. We're real internationalists. We really do stand with other people from the rest of the world. We do really do not have any change to lose, but other workers change from wherever they are from. This is our task that's in front of us, and it's a task that we can achieve, providing we understand we have to build organisations that can do it. But I also want a revolutionary party to do that. But comrades, join us in this struggle. You're the leadership of it, we're the leadership of it, and we can change the world if we do it.